In Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back, released in 1980, Luke Skywalker crash lands his X-Wing in the swamps of a strange, foggy planet full of slimy green foliage and strange creatures. And it was on this planet, Dagobah, that the young Skywalker would meet his destiny, training with Master Yoda to meet his true potential as a Jedi. 32 years later on Reddit, 2012, the name Dagobah would take on a whole new meaning. But instead of a young Jedi tapping into the Force to unlock fantastic powers, a young operating room nurse tapped into a disgusting infected anus to unlock a lifetime of scars. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Swamps of Dagobah. This video is sponsored by... Hey, what are you doing in my apartment, Sir Nicholas, Rainbeast, and Frostbringer from Raid Shadow Legends? Raid Shadow Legends is an RPG with over 500 champions, each one tailored for different situations. And really, the game is all about figuring out which combinations will complement each other to make the perfect teams for each part of the game. Recently, I got my Kyle up to level 60 and goddamn he is a beast. And after months of teasing it, Raid has finally released their biggest ever update, the Doom Tower, with 120 floors and 12 insanely difficult bosses. On top of that, they're also releasing 14 awesome new champions in time for the holidays, along with a whole host of holiday events and tournaments. If you want to get a head start in Raid, all you gotta do is click the link in the description. And if you're a new player, you'll get your free Void Champion Bulwark, 50 gems, an XP booster, some energy refills, and even an Ancient Shard as soon as you get in-game. All your treasure will be waiting for you up here. Find me in the game under the name Wang and join my clan. We just unlocked the hard tier clan boss. Just click the link in my description and I'll see you in the game. The Swamps of Dagobah story is at this point probably the most requested story for me to cover in a video and perhaps the most infamous Reddit story that I've yet to touch. It begins on August 4th, 2012, in a thread created by Squeeples entitled Doctors slash nurses slash redditors. The three most qualified types of medical professionals. What has been your most gory, disgusting, or worst medical experience? The thread was inspired by Squeeple's experience as a volunteer nursing assistant, the story that made them quit the profession. They described an elderly cancer patient whose skin had turned purple all over from ruptured blood vessels. And after two days where they constantly struggled to keep his pain under control with morphine, he finally passed away. Squeeple didn't have it in him to keep seeing such scenarios play out over and over again, yet they maintained a fascination with such stories. Thus, the thread. And it garnered all kinds of horrifying responses from the medical field. A child covered in cigarette burns that his parents swore was a skin condition. A bacterial meningitis patient whose face swelled up and turned purple as he cried blood. A car crash victim whose head came off in an EMT's hands. This entire thread is filled with scenarios that go beyond the wildest depths of your imagination. But above all, there's one story from this thread that's reached legendary status and has been shared over and over again forever on Reddit. The story was told in a comment by an operating room nurse named Banzai Panda. For a long time, I've been trying to figure out the best way to present this story in a video, and frankly, every attempt to cut in some commentary or summarize it just didn't do it justice. You gotta just hear it all the way through. So with that being said, it's about a 10 minute read. Go get yourself a snack, maybe some yogurt, and just let the story wash over you. But anyway, without further ado, I present to you The Swamps of Dagobah. Oh, our nurse here. This is kind of a long one. I was taking a call one night and woke up at 2 in the morning for a general surgery call. Pretty vague, but at the time I lived in a town that had a large population of young military guys and avid meth users, so late night emergencies were common. Got to the hospital, where a few more details awaited me. Perirectal abscess. For the uninitiated, this means that somewhere in the immediate vicinity of the asshole, there was a pocket of pus that needed draining. Needless to say, our entire crew was less than thrilled. I went down to the emergency room to transport the patient, and the only thing the ER nurse said as she handed me the chart was, have fun with this one. Amongst healthcare professionals, 
Vague statements like that are a bad sign. My patient was a 314 pound Native American woman who barely fit on the stretcher I was transporting her on. She was rolling frantically side to side and moaning in pain, pulling at her clothes and muttering Hail Marys. I could barely get her name out of her after a few minutes of questioning, so after I confirmed her identity and what we were working on, I figured it was best just to get her to the anesthesiologist so we could knock her out and get this circus started. She continued her theatrics the entire 10 minute ride to the OR, nearly falling off the surgical table as we were trying to put her under anesthetic. We see patients like this a lot though. Chronic drug abusers who don't handle pain well and who have used so many drugs that even increased levels of pain medication don't touch simply because of high tolerance levels. It should be noted, tonight's surgical team was not exactly wet behind the ears. I had been working in healthcare for several years already, mostly psych and medical settings. I have watched an 88 year old man tear a 1 inch diameter catheter balloon out of his penis while screaming, you'll never make me talk. I have been attacked by an HIV positive neo-Nazi, I have seen some shit. The other nurse had been in the OR as a trauma specialist for over 10 years. The anesthesiologist had done residency at a level 1 trauma center, or as we call them, knife and gun clubs. The surgeon was ex-army and averaged about 8 words and 2 facial expressions a week. None of us expected what was about to happen next. We got the lady off to sleep, put her into the stirrups, and I began washing off the rectal area. It was red and inflamed, a little bit of pus was seeping through, but it was all pretty standard. Her chart had noted she had been injecting IV drugs through her perineum. So this was obviously an infection from dirty needles or bad drugs, but overall, it didn't seem to warrant her repeated cries of, oh Jesus, kill me now. The surgeon steps up with a scalpel, sinks just the tip in, and at the exact same moment, the patient had a muscle twitch in her diaphragm, and just like that, all hell broke loose. Unbeknownst to us, the infection had actually tunneled nearly a foot into her abdomen, creating a vast cavern full of pus, rotten tissue, and fecal matter that had seeped outside of her colon. This godforsaken mixture came rocketing out of that little incision like we were recreating the funeral scene from Jane Austen's Mafia. We all wear waterproof gowns, face masks, gloves, hats, the works, all of which were as helpful as rain boots against the fire hose. The bed was in the middle of the room, an easy 7 feet from the nearest wall, but by the time we were done, I was still finding bits of rotten flesh pasted against the back wall. As the surgeon continued to advance his blade, the torrent just continued. The patient kept seizing against the ventilator, not uncommon in surgery, and with every muscle contraction she shot more of this brackish, grey-brown fluid out onto the floor until, within minutes, it was seeping into the other nurse's shoes. I was nearly 12 feet away, jaw dropped open with my surgical mask, watching the second nurse dry heaving and the surgeon on tiptoes to keep the stuff from soaking his socks any further. The smell hit them first. Oh god, I just threw up in my mask. The other nurse was out. She tore off her mask and sprinted out of the room, shoulders still heaving. Then it hit me, mouth still wide open not able to believe the volume of fluid this woman's body contained. It was like getting a great big bite of the despair and apathy that permeated this woman's life. I couldn't fucking breathe. My lungs simply refused to pull any more of that stuff in. The anesthesiologist went down next, an ex-NCAA D1 tailback, his 6 foot 2 frame shaking as he threw open the door to the OR suite in an attempt to get more air in letting me glimpse the second nurse still throwing up in the sinks outside the door. Another geyser of pus splashed across the front of the surgeon. The YouTube clip of David at the dentist keeps playing in my head. Is this real life? In all operating rooms, everywhere in the world, regardless of socialized or privatized, secular or religious, big or small, there is one thing the same. Somewhere, there is a bottle of peppermint concentrate. Everyone in the department knows where it is, everyone knows what it is for, and everyone prays to their gods that they never have to use it. In times like this, 
we rub it on the inside of our masks to keep the outside smells at bay long enough to finish the procedure and shower off. I sprinted to our central supply, ripping open the drawer where this vial of ambrosia was kept, and was greeted by an empty fucking box. The bottle had been emptied and not replaced. Somewhere out there was a godless bastard who had used the last of the peppermint oil and not replaced a single fucking drop of it. To this day, if I figure out who it was, I'll kill them with my bare hands, but not before cramming their head up the colon of every last meth user I can find, just so we're even. I darted back into the room with the next best thing I could find, a vial of mastitol, which is an adhesive rub we use sometimes for bandaging. It's not as good as peppermint, but Considering that over one-third of the floor was now thoroughly coated in what could easily be mistaken for a combination of bovine afterbirth and maple syrup, we were out of options. I started rubbing as much of the mask tool as I can get on the inside of my mask, just glad to be spelling anything except whatever slimy demon spawn we just cut out of this woman. The anesthesiologist grabbed the vial next, dousing the front of his mask in it, so we could stand next to his machines long enough to make sure this woman didn't die on the table. It wasn't until later that we realized that Mastitol can give you a mild high from huffing it like this. But in retrospect, that's probably what got us through. By this time, the smell had permeated out of our OR suite and down the 40-foot hallway to the front desk, where the other nurse still sat, eyes bloodshot and watery clenching her stomach desperately. Our suite looked like the underground river of ooze from Ghostbusters 2, except dirty. Oh, so dirty. I stepped back into the OR suite, not wanting to leave the surgeon by himself in case he genuinely needed help. It was like one of those overly artistic representations of a zombie apocalypse you see on fan forums. Here's this one guy in blue surgical garb standing nearly ankle deep in lumps of dead tissue, fecal matter, and several liters of syrupy infection. He was performing surgery in the swamps of Dagobah. Except the swamps had just come out of this woman's ass and there was no Yoda. He and I didn't say a word for the next 10 minutes as he scraped the inside of the abscess until all the dead tissue was out. The front of his gown was a gruesome mixture of brown and red. His eyes squinted against the stinging vapors originating directly in front of him. I finished my required paperwork as quickly as I could, helping him stuff the recently vacated opening full of gauze, taped this woman's buttocks closed, and hauled the dressing for as long as possible, woke her up, and immediately shipped off to the recovery ward. Until then, I'd only heard of alcohol showers. Turns out, 70% isopropyl alcohol is about the only thing that can even touch a scent like that once it's soaked into your skin. It takes four or five bottles to really get clean, but it's worth it. It's probably the only scenario I can honestly endorse drinking a little of it too. As we left the locker room, the surgeon and I looked at each other, and he said the only negative sentence I heard him utter in two and a half years of working together. That was bad. The next morning, the entire department, a fairly large floor within the hospital, still smelled. The housekeepers told me later that it took them nearly an hour to suction up all the fluid and debris left behind. The OR suite itself was closed off and quarantined for two more days, just to let the smell finally clear out. I laugh now when I hear new recruits to healthcare talk about the worst thing they've seen. You ain't seen shit, kid. TLDR. Don't shoot IV drugs into your taint. That deserves an upvote, and you deserve a freaking medal of honor. Is it weird that your story makes me want to be a doctor even more? It kind of is. Clearly, after reading the story, the majority of Redditors were floored by it, not just for what it contained, but for how it was told. So the next thing Reddit does, of course, is ask for shitty watercolor to paint it. Shitty watercolor responds with an IOU. Regrettably, Mr. Shitty is currently unable to paint rectal explosions as he is painting a series of watercolors to mark the final descent of curiosity. Yours sincerely, Mr. Shitty. You see, while all of Reddit was enthralled by this tale of an infected exploding asshole, the Mars rover Curiosity was making its final descent back to Earth. 
How fucking serendipitous is it that this video that starts with a, a Star Wars reference somehow manages to circle back to actual real-life space travel? In any case, shitty watercolor would make good on this drawing two years later, receiving Banzai Panda's seal of approval. Speaking of Banzai Panda's Star Wars reference, Redditors also took this opportunity to try and come up with a name for this story. They recognized that this one would also be remembered among stories like the Jolly Rancher story, so they had to come up with a name for it where you just say it then you know what it is automatically. And actually of all the suggestions, Swamps of Dagobah wasn't one of them. The closest being the Dagobah story. But some honorable mentions include Maple Syrup River, The Asplosion, and Zombie Butt Geyser. But throughout the rest of the thread, without anybody saying that this is what we were gonna call the story, people just seem to latch on to that one phrase, Swamps of Dagobah, because really it's just such a solid pull for what this is. They recognize that you could just say Swamps of Dagobah, and anyone who's familiar with the story knows you're not talking about Star Wars. And of course, with any story like this on Reddit, you had those who doubted its authenticity. And while obviously you couldn't verify something like this without a gross violation of privacy, but other medical professionals in the thread seemed to co-sign the idea that, oh yeah, this is a thing that happens. So what happened to the patient after? As far as Banzai Panda knows, she survived. And not only that, the Swamps of Dagobah lady dipped without paying, or as Banzai Panda put it, she dined and dashed. And I'm sure there's British people watching this that are like, yeah, and? So Banzai Panda explains further. Healthcare financing is tricky, much in the way that Shilab's lair is tricky. This particular individual was covered by Indian Health Services, which covers Native Americans. So normally we send the bill to them but IHS requires registration, and she hadn't registered. And because you can't squeeze blood from a turnip, it doesn't matter how many delinquent notices you send someone, if they don't pay, and they don't have any money in the first place, there's not a lot you can do to them. So that lady got to spray her ass ectoplasm all over the hospital, mark her territory for who knows how long, and not even pay a dime. Sounds like a win to me. Seeing how much interest there was in this story, later that day, Banzai Panda would do an AMA. In the initial post, Banzai Panda gives more specific details about his work. I specialize in spine and orthopedics, trauma and general surgeries, but have experience in pretty much every specialty. I've carried breasts in a Ziploc bag, seen a broken penis, it's a real thing, sawed off legs while the patient was awake, seen pus rocket out of rectums, plus lots of other cool stuff. He also stated that he wouldn't give away any information like locations that would compromise past patients or co-workers. He also said he wouldn't diagnose people in the comments, although there was at least one person who was not deterred by that warning. He also had to clarify that he is in fact a male nurse, because everyone seemed to assume he was a woman because he's a nurse. So in a lot of the thread we got some insight about Banzai Panda's background. At some point, he considered teaching before ultimately going into nursing as both of his parents had, and ultimately starting off working at the same hospital that they did. He hadn't gone to med school because he thought at first that it would be above his head, but after actually getting into the field, he began to reconsider it. Although he did have some concerns about knowing just how much depth you go into in med school. But of course, what most people wanted from this thread was just more crazy stories. And they absolutely did get a lot of crazy stories from Banzai Panda. When asked about what his most nerve-wracking operating room experience was, he spoke of a young cliff diver who had burst two vertebrae and was hypothermic from the cold water. At the same time, the temporary surgeon that was brought in for this procedure was furious that the room was too warm to operate in. With the patient still awake and listening to everything, he began to yell at the rest of the staff until they got things in order. Ultimately, that surgeon was reported and banned from the hospital. Another incident he described was of a man with gangrene of the butt and testicles. A situation where his flesh was so rotten that one of his testicles was just kind of just out hanging loose. The strangest thing he's ever taken out of somebody? There's a few. Carrots stuck all the way in the bladder. Not just once, but twice. A man and a woman. I guess that's a more popular sounding implement than I realized. A needle stuck in a roll of fat. And a dildo stuck so far up someone's ass that they had to cut them open and as he put it, milk it out by hand. And apparently the staff all took bets on what color it was going to be. And when asked about what the saddest case he ever dealt with was, he told the story of a church camp bus that was full of kids and flipped onto its side, 
Several of the kids got their limbs caught under the windows. He worked on two sisters, one of which had her leg bone exposed. Some of the nurses, who themselves had kids, couldn't stop crying and just had to leave the room. But he stood by as the plastic surgeon stripped the dead tissue to prevent infection. Fortunately, the girls did survive, and in a post about their follow-ups, he laments one of the strange downsides of being in this field. One was a little worse off than the other, and she came back for several skin grafts, but both of them went home to their families within a few days. I was lucky enough to be in on her subsequent procedures. One of the unforeseen downsides to being in the OR is that we never get to see the outcome of our work. We do our part, and then the patient is gone. We never know the ending. It was pretty special to get to see her slowly heal and eventually leave us. Bonsai Panda shared a lot of stories in this thread, and I'm not going to read all of them, so I definitely recommend if you're interested going and checking out the original thread. Bonsai Panda also took the opportunity to reflect on how working in this field can affect someone's mindset. In particular, one user asked if seeing all these crazy scenarios play out in front of them has made him more cautious in his own life. And he mentioned that in some ways it had the opposite effect, showing how resilient the human body can be. In particular, after being diagnosed with bone cancer, thankfully non-fatal, he decided to take up powerlifting, an interest that his posting history reveals that he has kept up with throughout the years. At this point, it's been about 8 years since Banzai Panda's story, Swamps of Dagobah, has become a thing of legend. But much more recently, Vice had the chance to catch up with Banzai Panda, whose name they identified as Kelly, and who they referred to as She, which I guess the name Kelly didn't help in that situation, to reflect on this old story. He mentions that although he didn't necessarily realize it at the time, it actually wound up being very therapeutic for him to share these stories in this way. And with this story becoming such a famous tale, he shared a little anecdote about it bleeding into his real life. My internet fame has had the same effects on my life as pretty much everyone else's. Not at all. Probably the closest thing to an IRL effect was when I was working at a university hospital in Seattle and overheard two new surgical residents discussing my Reddit story and trying to decide if it was real or not. Neither of them having any idea that the author was standing in the room behind them. That was the first time I realized just how many people were actually on Reddit and how far the story had spread. But anyway, that's the story of Swamps of Dagobah. If you like this video, you should check out my video on Blowfly Girl. I'm out. Are you for